This is the Television Enthusiast Podcast, The Weekly Set. Episode 35, recorded December 4th, 2015. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Weekly Set Podcast. Uh, this is the TV Enthusiast official podcast. We get together every week. Uh, myself, Tyson Gifford, your host, uh, William Rorig, and uh, Kat Taylor. The three of us get together. We talk about what's going on on TV, what we've been watching. Uh, you know, if there's some kind of big news to talk about, we'll bring that up. Today, we're just kind of playing a little bit loose. We, we haven't done a regular podcast in a while. We did the winter schedule a few weeks ago. We took off last week because, you know, well, Thanksgiving, it wasn't we record these on Thursdays. We weren't exactly going to be recording it on Thanksgiving. <laughs> so uh, today we're just going to be kind of going over what we've been kind of watching in this uh, last couple of weeks. So I'm going to start things off. Right right before we started recording, we were having a kind of a little fun time disparaging Once Upon a Time a little bit. So I'm going to just pop us right into there while it's fresh out of my eyes. So Kat stopped watching Once Upon a Time because... Uh, it just it, it reached its threshold point for her. I honestly, don't blame her. And after the after the hook reveal, I was like, "Oh come on!" <laughs> I, I was like, and, 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 "You know what? This the, the worst part of it. This was like this was like the second episode in a night where they decided to air two episodes in a row." <laughs> yep. And the first episode was about Brave, uh, Meridia. And I thought it was, like, a nice episode. I enjoyed it. It had a good story. Um, it was all about Meridia. And I thought, that, that was nice. I thought, that, that was nice. I like that. And and, and then the then was the episode with Hook. And I was like, this is straight garbage. Wow. <laughs> My recollection actually is that it was reversed, that they had a whole episode where they... They did this whole massive reveal that ended on, hey, Hook is also a dark one now, too. And then they ended on that and showed the second episode, which had, like, none of the main characters, and spent a whole hour gallivanting off of Merida and friends in a story only, like, peripherally attached to the main one. And that's, I think that one, too, punch for me was just such a massive eye roll that, like, you're going to end on that cliffhanger... And then you're going to give us something that oh, has yeah, absolutely yeah. nothing to do with it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's probably because I, I probably just watched them out of order on Hulu. <laughs> because <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> what's so frustrating is I really like the character of Hook. I really like Colin O'Donoghue in the role. But this, it, I found it to be such an utterly incomprehensible twist. And a frustrating one. Like, I feel like it completely... Like, the, the, this was supposed to be Dark Emma showcase. This was supposed to be a chance to see Dark Emma explore herself and really come out. And now, suddenly, at the last minute, it's been shanghaied by another character, which <laughs> right. so it's, frustrates me. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's like... It's like they can't quite commit. Right. Yeah. If you watch the latest episode, it's like, now Dark Emma is fully on the hero's side. And try of course to... she is. <laughs> yeah. Dark Emma, the hero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's she's back on the hero. So try trying to stop Hook, uh, who is now the new main villain of this arc. Apparently, I swear um, this show has absolutely no no <laughs> understanding whatsoever of the complexities of morality, and seeing it try to handle them in such juvenile ways. Is so irritating. It's. <laughs> I, had to, I had to stop watching. It was making me too many upset. So I'm only like halfway through the second season, and I've been saying that too. It's the morality issues on yeah. Once Upon a Time are pretty laughable. They're like, really? <laughs> Uh, there seems to be like an anti-adoption uh, agenda going on in the show that just kind of doesn't make much sense. The way they're kind of treating the idea that like Emma can just kind of take over this kid's life and you know and that's like perfectly fine and it's <laughs> like no kind of no no thought for the psychological effect of of you know a child in this situation or it's just don't it's worry such it's a mess. Henry. He yeah. has almost no personality, and he's basically just full of like, um, manipulative guilt and inexplicable optimism. 
Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, so basically, Dark Emma is basically just slightly more secretive Emma. <laughs> Yeah. It's it's uh it's it's Emma in the um Arrowverse. <laughs> in Arrow's defense, Arrow's not the only show where secrets are a big problem. <laughs> oh, I get what you're saying, Arrowverse. Okay, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Oliver Queen was, and once upon a time, he'd be considered a dark one. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Oh, but imagine how much more interesting he would make it. Oliver Queen in his first season was a genuinely morally ambiguous character, the kind that once upon a time couldn't make it its wildest dreams. Yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, but, I mean, it, it, it's the point where I'm enjoying... I, I really think, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because we talked about this, but then they got uh, King Arthur who is genuinely a morally ambiguous character because he he's, he's basically just this awful person, but he strongly believes what he's doing is right and what he's doing is for the good of his kingdom and, you know, ultimately for the greater good, even though he's doing these bad things, and, like, no other character on the show acts like that. And it's it just like, sounds, it sounds like the, sh- the showrunners just couldn't commit to a dark Emma. Right. Like they were kind yeah. of scared about where to take it, and they just could not commit. And it's like they made they, they wrote a check, and now they're like struggling to cash it. You know. <laughs> and I guess it's it's a risky thing to turn your main character evil. And I I you don't wonder sometimes if the network sometimes balks at this, especially on a show that's trying so hard to be family friendly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this, I mean, I've seen this on Supernatural when they turned Dean into a demon for, like, three episodes, and then mm. Sam turned him back. Like, this, the last season ended on Dean turning into a demon, and then the, when the new season started, it was, like, all of three episodes before he was Dean again. And it's, <laughs> like, the, it's like they really didn't want to fully commit to that. It's like, I don't know. And I feel like it's the same way here. Because I just don't think with when, sure. when it came comes to Dean, I don't I don't think they had, you know, he was already kind of an anti-hero type character. Right. He's yeah. al- he's already a little ambiguous as far as morality goes. Like the only thing he really cares about is his family, you know. Right. So, so how much further could they really push that? Yeah, like you can't push it too much further without going into straight going leapfrogging moral ambiguity and going straight to villainy. No, well, that's, that's why I thought they were going. I thought that's where I thought they were going straight to villainy with that character because that's what that implied, but it didn't happen. Apparently not. And yeah. So, Here's another thing that drives me nuts on Once Upon a Time is the the just mind-boggling double standards they have, especially when it comes to all things Regina. Because I read that apparently in the most recent episode, Henry's like, I'm willing to forgive my mother and all the terrible things she did, and it's like. What she like manipulated you that one time and manipulated Merida that one time, as opposed to Henry's other mother, who slaughtered hundreds, if not thousands, of people in an attempt to get revenge on Snow White. Like the the, the imbalance there is just mind-boggling, and it very clearly <laughs> troubles me the way the writers. Oh, oh no! Oh no! In the new episode, like like uh, Emma offers to help, and then Henry Henry rejects her and says he can't trust her anymore. <laughs> what? As yeah. opposed to, I mean, his, his Regina spent the entire first season lying to and manipulating him. Yeah, but, but Henry said... Crap. Way too. worse than anything Emma did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is, it's just such bad, it's such bad writing because instead of showing uh, Emma do really terrible things, and allowing us to understand why Henry might not understand her anymore, they just instead have Henry tell us that yeah, Henry is terrible. Yeah, it's on tell no show. Yes. Oh, it's just such subpar writing. I think you can understand why I found a an episode focused so much on a periphery character and that had nothing really to do with like the main arc and uh, and just like only featured like some of the characters from the main arc so much more entertaining <laughs> that was actually important to the plot 
because that's how bad the plot is. I would rather watch the show <laughs> be about Merida than anything about Dark Emma or Dark Hook or whatever. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I can I can definitely see that. The, the self-contained Merida stuff is less of a train wreck. Yeah. I mean, well, that's that, that's the case oftentimes whenever, like, uh, a current story arc isn't that great. You know, it gets to the point where you're like, okay, now I want the the little <laughs> the little uh, pocket episodes, you know, the individuals. And also, also, like, the like the moment between Merida and her father, and, like, the, the ghost of her father, that, that was, like, a bit, genuinely very touching moment. And I, uh-huh. yeah, I mean, that was just a good episode. Um, <laughs> but, I, yeah, I mean... I don't the, like like I like I said everything in the Camelot plot everything happening in Camelot that seems to be a good story um, that's that all that stuff is fine them trying to figure out how to exterminate the darkness in Emma before she fully becomes a dark one um, that's all well and good. Um, how long does it take to become a dark one? Didn't it happen like instantaneously with Rumpelstiltskin? Yeah, it did actually. Like like that night he came well, back and was all of a sudden like cruel and I feel like that was kind of the point is that Rumpelstiltskin was more accepting of it and Emma was more resistant so it took her longer. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point too. Yeah, because Emma was trying to resist it. But how much longer? <laughs> it's like half a season. And so, and so they were like looking for, you know, they were looking for a way to free her in Camelot, and I thought that's a decent plot. And you know, when they, and you know, I mean, and the Dark Emma could have been good too if they decided to go anywhere with it, but they didn't. So all the stuff happening in the present just seems like a complete waste of time. And it just keeps getting more insulting. I really think the entire season should have just been in Camelot and been about that, rather than all this Dark Emma stuff, which they totally whiffed on. Um, it sounds like they need to just start going crazy again. Yeah. It feels like like whenever like the plot starts getting really kind of unbelievable on the show, they just like throw you a curveball by just putting in a whole bunch of new characters from all sorts of crazy. <laughs> yeah. so you, it sounds you like we need to see a time the, You haven't even gotten to the craziest stuff they've done. What? <laughs> What? Sounds like we need to see a tie fight, uh, tie fighter fly, flying over the sky and an Infinity Gauntlet <laughs> oh, appearance. Gosh. Oh gosh, no! Don't have Star Wars enter the Once Upon a Time oh, universe. No. Yeah, let's not do that. One thing, <laughs> one thing I do like about this season is the the fact that they are actually exploring the Dark One, like the history of the Dark One. Uh, you know, they they have the first Dark One on there now. <laughs> Hi. And they have, uh... Yeah, and I liked the twist that it was Nimue. Yeah. That was cool. Yeah, I thought that was cool. That Yeah, that was a good twist. And so I, I like the fact that they are actually exploring that aspect of the lore in more depth. Um... But, so that's another good thing about this, but other than that, it's... Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about Doctor Who, because Doctor Who had some pretty eventful episodes recently. <laughs> yeah. Are you up to date, Kat? Yes. Okay, so um, first off, it almost doesn't seem real to me that a certain character is gone. Yeah. I, I'm almost expecting a swerve. <laughs> are you, are you well, in that same boat? Especially because I expected her, her exit to come in the very last episode of the season. Mm-hmm. And, Are and you still kind of expecting so a swerve like, or not, or? Huh? Are you still expecting them to kind of do a swerve on us? I wouldn't be surprised if something could still happen. Like, obviously, we know she's departing the show, and and I wasn't remotely surprised it involved death because they've been foreshadowing that all season long. But mm-hmm. um, given what a swerve the ending to last week's episode was, I think it's fair to say I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. I love how last week's episode, like, turned into a Groundhog's Day episode at the end. Right? Oh my gosh, that was just so (laughs) trippy. I actually loved that about it, because I expected the episode to be just basically like an hour of the Doctor by himself in a prison, 
talking to himself and figuring things out and getting over Clara's death. And, I, and it would have been great. Peter probably would have sold it. It would have been fun, and then we would have moved on. But then suddenly when you start to realize that he's done this before and he's doing it again, and holy crap, it just expended it two million years and then capped by that, like, <laughs> those final moments, I literally just went, whoa, I can't believe what that episode turned into. Yeah, and it was like, and then you, you start to think back, like, oh, that first time we saw him, like, fall in the water and you saw all those skulls. Yeah. And then you see later on in the episode when the skull falls off the tower into the water. Yep, and, you're and, like, and oh. the skull that he finds on the floor with bird written next to it. Yeah, and it's just, yeah, it's just him over and over again. So cool, and I loved that line he made at the very end because he was talking about that the grim fairy tale about the the bird that kept uh, sharpening its beak on the diamond mountain, and he says something about it sounds like a hell of a bird, and I was like, that's just such a perfect capper to what this character just accomplished. <laughs> yeah, it just took billions of years, but you know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Also, um, I, there was an awesome symmetry to it because uh, the opener, the, um, the season opener, the first half ended with a reveal that Scarrow was back, and so it was so perfect that the first half of his finale was the reveal that he had found his way back to Gallifrey. <laughs> yeah, that was very cool. Yeah, that that was definitely cool. When did when did you catch on that he was on Gallifrey? He, was it like um, when you saw the city, or did you catch on a little bit before? Well, what happened is he leaned down and said to the boy, tell them I've come the long way round. And his very last line, the very last line from Matt Smith's doctor in the 50th anniversary was, I finally know where I'm going home the long way round. So the moment mm -hmm. he said, I've come the long way round, I was like, oh, he's on Gallifrey. <laughs> <laughs> and then they pull up and you see the city and you're like, yeah. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, so that was an amazing episode. I could see that easily going down in the annals of like all time greatest for the series. Yeah, it, it's weird because it's usually when you think of the great Doctor Who episodes, they tend to be like the standalone ones. Like I don't really think about you know um, when I think like oh what's a great Doctor Who episode? If I want to get somebody into the show. And I can only have, like, one episode to go. I'm thinking, like, you know, oh, A, a Christmas Carol or Blink. Or, you know, I mean, I'm thinking of these little one-off episodes. I do uh, the, love the Fireplace the, um, one, you know? It's like... The, yeah, I do love Girl in the Fireplace and the, um, the Doctor Dances Empty Child two-parter. But I'll also shamelessly admit that Journey's End is one of my favorite episodes of the entire series. So, like, <laughs> I totally get is, what is you're saying. Is that the one where he's getting old? Huh? Is that the one where you see him, like, really old? Journey's End is the fourth season finale. It's the one okay. where they bring together, like, ten with, like, every single major companion and character from the first four seasons. Okay, yeah. Against Davros. Oh yeah, that's we got like a, a Jack back and yeah, it's this perfect capper to the first four seasons, and I absolutely love it. But I totally get what you're saying, and I bet a lot of people would agree with you because they probably say like Blink and Midnight and and Girl in the Fireplace, you know, and episodes like that are like are really emblematic of what makes the series great. I just did like a top 10 Christmas episodes list on our site and like one of them I gave it was, you know, I mean, Doctor Who of course has tons of Christmas specials, <laughs> but I, I never really liked a lot of their Christmas specials, uh -huh. um, but A Christmas Carol, I loved. I yeah. loved that episode, you know, <laughs> and, and that made it pretty, you know, a pretty decent place on the list. So it's like, yeah, it's it's these standalones that are usually to me the, the better ones, but yeah, this is this is not a standalone. This is like an arc episode, but it, but it's also a standalone. But it's also standalone. Yeah, like it's important to the arc, but it doesn't appear that way going in. And I think the fact that because I feel like you could sit down and watch it without much knowledge of the series, and mm -hmm. once because regardless of that whole reveal at the end that he's on Gallifrey, just the whole understanding of what he endured for two billion years. Is just nothing short of like mind blowing. It's such yeah. a cool, cool turn. Definitely, and it's making me look really, you know, look forward to, to seeing the 
the end of the kind of mid season, I guess. And have you started? Have you have you been avoiding seeing like the kind of the, the little bits we're getting about the Christmas special? Yeah, I don't look at any spoilers for Doctor Who because okay, I then I won't say anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just I, gonna say I, that I'm excited about the Christmas special too. Oh, good. Oh, good. I absolutely loved last year's Christmas special. I thought it was was really great. With uh, Nick Frost, yeah. Nick Frost is Santa Claus. <laughs> and the whole Inception, like, there's the dream within a dream within a dream. And yeah. I, I thought it, the whole thing was just a kick. I loved it. I could say one one thing I'm a little down about is I ended I like I'm like really you know why is uh, Maisie Williams character again like you know doing something just kind of fucked up like you know like I thought she learned her lesson like the one time you know they had that moment at the end where she kind of realized like oh I do have a personality I do care about things sure well my sister's <laughs> theory is that um, she thinks because we don't know who it was that got a shielder to do this to the doctor. She thinks that it was the doctor himself and a shielder mm. for gods. Well, it could be with, like, the reveal that happened um, at the end of this last episode. It could very well be the case that they needed the, to pull I that mean, around. The reveal that he was inside of his own confession dial and that it brought him to Gallifrey certainly suggest that, like, isn't, you know, those are things he would have wanted. So, I, I don't know, that there's definitely more to be revealed there. <laughs> Which makes me feel even more that there's going to be a swerve about the character death. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be remotely surprised. I'm, I'm, I'm betting she'll appear in some capacity in the final episodes. And, mm -hmm. I mean, there's been at least two or three times prior in this season where the doctor thought Clara was dead when she wasn't. So. Yeah. Um, well, let's move on. Let's uh, give us a little bit about Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. So I've still only seen the first episode. I haven't had a chance to watch more. As you, as we talked about, I think, before the podcast, we're getting very close to that point where all of our favorite shows are going on hiatus, and that's going to be the time when I'm going to be able to start investing in that. But... Um, tell me a little bit about how Crazy Ex-Girlfriend's been advancing. Uh, it's been advancing well. It's actually becoming one of my favorite shows now. Hmm. Um, just, just because, oh my god, it's so wonderful. Like, like, yeah, yeah, this, this woman has, like, serious, legit problems. In fact, <laughs> in fact, the entire last episode, not the last episode, but the one before the last episode that aired was entirely about mental illness to the point where she was ta she was eating uh, ADD pills off of the bat she found on the bathroom floor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is something when I, I remember when I was first talking to you about this show where it was one of the things that held me back from watching the show at all was the idea that like it just seemed kind of crazy but like they weren't addressing the crazy. And then, you know, you were saying, like, oh, no, they're showing, you know, they're, they're going into mental illness. Oh, yeah. And at that point, I was like, okay, now I actually do want to watch this. And I watched it, and even in the first episode, I mean, there's scenes where you can see, like, oh, yeah, they are they're getting into mental illness. So. Yeah, they are fully embracing the crazy aspect of the title. Kat, I just want to say, Kat, if nothing else, I want you to see that the, um, from the first episode, there's one musical number about it's the sexy getting ready song <laughs> where it's like it's talking about girls like, you know, and all the work they put in to get ready to go on like a date or something. Uh -huh. And there's like a whole song about it. And it's so ridiculous and over the top. And then like it's all like, let's check in with the guys. And they're just like laying on a couch. <laughs> <laughs> But then, like, the funniest part is they had, like, a rapper that was supposed to come in and be, like, you know, doing his part or something during her Getting Ready song. And then he, like, but the rapper instead was, like, looking at her, like, like, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, you your girls go through all this all the time? <laughs> I need to write some letters. And the episode ends, and he's, like, writing letters to all the girls that he, like, you know. <laughs> that he... I, gotta, I gotta apologize to some bitches. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really funny. I think you I think you dig that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good. If nothing else, just check out that that song or whatever <laughs> because it's really funny. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of great songs. There's that song. There's the uh, there's the I have friends song. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, ha- I haven't seen that one yet, I don't think. No, no you haven't, because that's Lara. But she, she's like, I have friends. I definitely have friends. Okay. <laughs> Objectively, I could say that I have all the friends. <laughs> it's so sad. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's it, it it's a show that looks like it's a, there's a lot more to it than I originally thought. I think that's kind of a failure on the advertising part because they were emphasizing kind of like the crazy is and like oh look at it, some girl and she's crazy, and they should have been going more into it from the angle of like oh this girl's messed up. Yeah, yeah. You know? But it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the marketing you tried to sell it like as a romantic comedy when really it's just like this really fucked up like it's just this really fucked up show that is only like tangentially a romantic comedy in this woman's mind <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> or something I don't know it's hard to explain <laughs> yeah it's definitely a lot more than what I expected from it originally seeing it yeah it, it is. Um, the latest episode was actually her mother came to visit her. And oh, like, and her mother's a piece of work, too. <laughs> her mother's a piece of work, too. In fact, she's, like, one half of why this woman's completely messed up. And she, like, goes, bends over backwards to please this woman. Uh, t- <laughs> to, to, to the point of asking a man to have sex with her mom. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> It's yeah. Sounds like the just the right amount of awkward. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to see that. Yeah, <laughs> I have to see it. it it's definitely it's it's definitely one of the best new shows of the fall season on the um, Yeah. Yeah, this one this one actually turned out to be a real gem. Yeah, that and Screen Queens. That and Screen. <laughs> Yes, Screen Queens continues to pay off really well. I there's there's parts where I'm just cracking up watching that. So. Oh my god! This last <laughs> this latest episode was like like freaking Emma Roberts' whole thing about Black Friday. Yeah, I saw that. So I, I I told you like I didn't see this episode. I watched about half of it. So I did see the thing about Black Friday and about how she drives to get in early and then shops in front of all the people like <laughs> waiting behind the closed doors and. She, like, she, takes, like, all the deals, like... <laughs> she, she calls them, like, all the stampeding hippos or something. <laughs> yeah. God, she's so horrible, it's funny. <laughs> I know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, those are two of the kind of surprise hits of the season. But, you know, not just from us, but a lot a lot of people have been kind of talking about both of those shows. So, um, yeah, let's uh, move on. I wanted to talk a little bit about The Leftovers because I've been kind of putting off watch. I haven't w- been watching it as actively, and it's doing a lot of really interesting things in its second season. It's definitely feeling a lot more like a Damon Lindelof show now. It's definitely starting to get some of those lost vibes in there. Some like the kind of cryptic, bad way. <laughs> good way. It's getting okay. those kind of cryptic mystery right, elements right. are starting to kind of feed in. When you like, say Damon Lindelof, it can be either good or bad. Well, like if you watch like the first season of Leftovers, there's a big like rapture like event that occurs, and then the whole show after that is like a drama about people dealing with it. There's like there isn't really anything cryptic. There's no real mystery to what's going on or something like that. Um, second season kind of starts bringing in some more mystery elements. It's, it's just getting a bit more. This is Damon Lindelof's Left Behind. Yeah. It's, <laughs> well, it's not Left Behind. It's <laughs> this isn't this isn't religious. I mean, it, it, it's a rapture-like event, but they don't even say. There's no nece- necessarily, like, that this is religious. And they even go into the idea that, like, there are some people that got, you know, raptured or that disappeared or that vanished that really you would not think of, <laughs> like, a rapture-like event. And plenty of people that were left behind that, you know, maybe shouldn't have been. But, I mean, like, they even made jokes about certain celebrities and stuff. And one was, like, Gary Busey that was <laughs> one of the ones that vanished. <laughs> Um, but yeah, in the second season, they're getting a lot more interesting with like, cause they, it, it's a very different show. I mean, they even completely changed the opening theme. It's just completely different opening theme. It has a totally different mood to it. Um, 
the, the main characters, they move to a new town, and there's like this whole other dynamic because it's just a whole different place. So you only really have kind of like the real central characters are the only ones that are really the same. Like all the kind of more background type characters are just, they're gone because they're still back in the other town. Um, so it's it's really a, a very different direction. It's really interesting what they've done with it. And, you know, the last couple of episodes are just starting to get into some really kind of interesting stuff. So they this this plot kind of came together that you kind of, you, you were seeing kind of the fringe elements of it. And then you did, we just saw like this episode where it showed this other character story that's like going on through basically the entire events of the second season. And it shows kind of what this character has been doing during those events. And it kind of reveals these things that you kind of didn't know what were, uh, it, it's picking up these, these loose threads that were kind of all over the place. And it's kind of showing, Oh, this is what they mean. This is how they tie together in this really kind of interesting way. So it's definitely becoming much more lost. Like I'd say, uh, in a very good way. So, uh, yeah, I've been enjoying it the last couple episodes, especially. Nice. Yeah, I've read the reviews of it that literally have just gushed about it being like the absolute best on TV. So I've I've heard really really good things about it. Not so much in the first season. The first season it got some some critical uh, uh, um, <laughs> angst. To, uh, you know, some some. There is a lot of criticism about certain aspects of the first season, and it's like he, you know, Lidloff really took that to heart when he went into the second season. And he even, like, I, I think I mentioned this before on the podcast, but like the new theme song for it is like this. It's kind of like a like a country song or something. I don't know what it is. It's probably some famous song that I just have no idea about. Uh, but like the lyrics are basically like, um, I think I'll just let the mystery be. And it's like it's basically like Lindelof chose that song to like represent his entire career as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> like, stop asking me what the answers are. <laughs> it's just about the mystery. <laughs> well, hey, kudos to him because you know, plenty of I think plenty of writers in that position sometimes can let their ego get to them, and they have a hard time taking constructive criticism, and they mm-hmm. can immediately put out bad material. I think Aaron Sorkin's a really good demonstration of it. <laughs> Yeah, he gets downright offended and just yeah, like, and, and, and and so kudos to him. And I think it's also a good demonstration of like I've probably ranted about this with Agents of Shield, but it does frustrate me that we don't give the same kind of allowance for mediocre shows with mediocre first seasons to to strive for something better. And yeah. it's like, I'm so glad that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., for instance, got that chance. I'm so glad that Parks and Rec got that chance because Parks and Rec turned into one of the best comedies on television and the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is one of my favorites on that I'm watching right now. So I'm yeah. really glad to hear that The Leftovers got, a, got that chance. Oh, yeah. It's, it's definitely much better. There's there's like a moment in like two episodes ago where I was just like, holy shit. You know, <laughs> I just got to like <laughs> react to like, oh, my God, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's been really good. So, um, let's move on from that. Uh, let's see. I also want to talk about, um, Supernatural just because I just watched, um, last night's Wednesday's episode and they actually went into imaginary friends. (laughs) So... (laughs) So it's like they, they, they go for lore and all these kind of different things that are commonplace, like, oh, yeah, different types of vampires or fox demons or, you know, now they're tackling imaginary friends. But it was kind of hilarious and charming and kind of cute in the way they did it. So um, I'm, I'm kind of happy that Supernatural is able to do things like this, you know, that they were able to do like a real sweet kind of musical episode for, like, their 200th that, you know, was kind of more like of a heartwarming, kind of sweet-natured thing. Um, I'm glad they can do things like that. Yeah, I completely agree. Supernatural is a really good show at breaking its own format, and that's a hard thing to be, because I feel like there's not, at least, there's not a lot of shows that I watch these days that can, and that's okay. Like, not every show should want to be that. But it is cool that Supernatural has built itself as something that can definitely pause and have a meta, meta, meta episode about fans writing fan fiction about them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh my god. Yeah, it's super supernatural is awesome because they could literally do anything and get away with it. And there have been so many great episodes of that just from them breaking their own format. Um you know, it, it, it totally works. I mean it, Yeah, I think I think they crossed a certain threshold at a certain point and they just realized yeah, we can put in characters from Oz. <laughs> yeah, we can do, you know, like, that's fine. There's there's a way that can fit. And <laughs> and it does, and it works, and it ends up being a great episode, so. <laughs> it's like, I know I've, I've seen multiple people ask if Flash could ever have a musical, because they have, like, five actors that are trained professional singers. Including the lead, yeah. But the thing is, is I just Flash just could not break its format in that way. I just don't think it could. It's if they're going to do a Flash musical, it has to be in the next crossover with Arrow. It's a different dimension in which everybody oh, sings. Everybody. <laughs> I do not want a musical episode. We need the duet, need the duet with uh, Oliver and, and Barry. Yeah, God. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know if uh, Stephen Amell can sing, but um, <laughs> the guy, the guy who plays Barry, is actually he used to be on Glee and he used to yeah, sing. So. Has a great voice. For the record, I've watched Stephen Amell at um, the most recent Nerd HQ, and he <laughs> sings his own version of "Look at This Stuff." And actually, he has a pretty good singing voice. But okay. I think he'd probably also be the first person to say no musical episode. <laughs> <laughs> they could they could do a musical crossover episode, but it would have to be something like the whole thing was a dream. Like they'd have to have like a character was like knocked out and was like I in like a bad state and like having some crazy dream. Rose and, and Buffy pulled it off because they both were the kind of kind of goofy meta textual format breaking. And obviously hmm. community could, but Arrow and Flash just don't have that as part of their fabric. <laughs> Also, I'd just like to point out to Will that if they had a duet between Oliver and Barry, you know all that would do is fuel lots of shipper fan fiction. Oh, God. So <laughs> let's, let's please not encourage that. Shipper <laughs> fan fiction, yeah, right. Really. Also, by the way, uh, Arrow has hit its highest ratings for this crossover episode since the last Flash crossover. I'm not surprised. Yep. <laughs> so uh, uh, we'll talk about the Flash episode as well as, you know, more about um, Jessica Jones. And by Flash episode, I mean the Arrow Flash crossover. Um, on, on when we do, we're going to do it on Sunday, so that'll be up on Monday when we do uh, TVE versus Marvel and DC. So we're going to have a lot to talk about. That's going to be kind of an epic episode. <laughs> Unlike last year's crossover, this crossover, both both episodes, Arrow and Flash, were basically just one long episode this this year. Yeah, I don't I don't necessarily feel so warm and fuzzy about it though. So oh, okay. we'll, we'll get into that on Sunday, and you guys can tell me what you think. But um, I think we're pretty much done with kind of shows that are coming up. I I want to ask you guys. We are getting to this point now where our shows are about to go on hiatus. I mean, it looks like uh, mid-season finales next week for Flash, Arrow, and Agents of Shield. Mm, sucks. Yeah, and I mean, we got It's gonna. We're gonna have this kind of break with the holiday season. Um, for me, that means I'm gonna have to start looking for new shows to start investing in, or shows that I've been kind of putting off. And I already mentioned I'm gonna be looking towards Crazy Ex-Girlfriend as one of the possibilities. <laughs> Do, do either of you have any kind of ideas on what you guys are going to start uh, watching during your mid-season break? Um, oh, yeah. I'm going to catch up on Fargo. I'm going to finish I'm going to finish this last season of Supernatural that I'm on, and I'm probably going to work on uh, catching up on The Walking Dead. Nice. Yeah. Um, I'm going to catch up on Arrow. I'm going to do a nice binge watch of that. Oh, so you are going to do that. Okay. Oh, yeah. I've been looking forward to it, but trying not to get my hopes up too much. Um, let's see. And then I want to catch up on The Grinder because I have a backlog of episodes to watch there. Um, I'm thinking of going back to Person of Interest. Mm -hmm. And I'm also doing a rewatch of uh, DS9 because it's on Netflix and I wanted to rewatch it because I love it. <laughs> 
Okay, so yeah, that's that's going to be some more stuff to to fuel our conversations in the next couple of weeks. So uh, let's go on to what is coming up um, next week. So there isn't too terribly much. All of it's going to be out by the time this podcast is up. But uh, we have two things coming up uh, on Friday, December 4th, which, like I said, if you're listening to this podcast, it priority is for you. Um, it already is for Will. Uh Transparent is uh, season two is starting up on Amazon. Uh, that's a good one to check out if you guys want to check out something like a kind of comedy that that skews more serious. Um, that's on Amazon Prime. The second season's going to be hitting that. Um, and a a very Murray Christmas, the Bill Murray Christmas special, is uh, hitting Netflix. So that's two things to kind of look forward to this week. Now, for me, I'm not looking forward to either of those because I'm about to get some Xenoblade Chronicles X on. (laughs) I hear that. (laughs) (laughs) All those video games that just just chip away at your time. Yeah. Fall is is the busiest time of the year for video games as well. I mean, there's Fallout 4, there's Star Wars Battlefront, um, Xenoblade Chronicles X... Um, yeah, yeah, and they're all like huge games too. Yeah, they're all huge games. <laughs> they're not just huge in like production values, but they're huge in le- just length, <laughs> amount of time they suck out of you. So yeah, uh, that that pretty much brings us to an end for this week. Uh, we wanted to get a little, start a little early, and we did. And this should be a little bit of a shorter podcast, but. Uh, Next week for our podcast, uh, we were going to do it this week, but we just weren't able to get around to it with everything else going on, you know, around the holiday season. But um, do you guys think you'll be ready to take on the Amazon pilot season for next week? I'm not holding my breath. Um, I don't know. I might be able to get in one or two episodes, but I might might have to just say I can only do a couple. So I'll I'll show up and talk about what I can. I'd be surprised Mm -hmm. if I can get. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I don't think I'll get to all of them either. <laughs> I'll probably pick about three or four of them. So, yeah. but but that should be good. I mean, if we end up picking the ones that look like the most interesting, then we can have a decent conversation. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I'm with Ken on that. I'll probably I I might get around to. I'll try to do three. But it, it 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 really depends on you know how busy I am and everything else. So yeah, so we'll we'll prepare for that, and we'll see if we can do that next week. If it, if it just turns out that it's we just don't have enough material to talk about with that, then we'll do something else, and we'll push that off for another week. But yeah, I mean, hell of a time for Amazon to have their pilot season <laughs> right around right around the time, or just right before I think is when the pilots came out. Right before they even put up their own Man in a High Castle, and Jessica Jones came out, and it's like ooh. <laughs> Bad timing, Amazon. <laughs> yeah, it's like, come on. It's like, yeah, so when you asked if we were ready to do the Amazon podcast this week, and I was like, no, because, you know, I was already, like, been, I was catching up on Jessica Jones. I was watching all my regular shows on top of it. It's mm-hmm. just, I just didn't want to watch the Amazon pilots when I could just be watching Jessica Jones and finish <laughs> that. <laughs> so one one quick thing before we leave, Kat, how far are you on Jessica Jones right now? I am halfway through episode nine. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, so by the time we get to um, this weekend, we'll be able to go through at least episode nine, right? Do you want me to try to push and finish the series? I bet I could try and finish that. If one. you could do that, that would be great. Just because we're gonna not have. We're going to have to go on hiatus after next week. Oh, sure, and, and we off. might as well take this chance to talk about it. So, yeah, I can totally finish it out. Okay, cool. Handle all of the David Tennant material. Because it's, <laughs> it's so confusing. How can I love this man? I want to love this man, and yet he's just so twisted. But it's David Tennant. I know, it's David Tennant. He, he, he's, he's, like, slimy, and he's horrible. But... <laughs> But it's David Tennant. It's David Tennant. <laughs> I love David Tennant. He's still very charming while he does it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff to talk about because we only covered, I think, the first two episodes in the last week. 
Uh, so yeah, we're we're gonna have a lot to talk about, uh, and the Arrow Flash crossover. So check that out on um, that should be up on Monday. So until then, thank you everybody for listening. Good night. Bye. If you would like to voice your opinion, send an email to the weekly set at tventhusiast.com. TV Enthusiast is a part of the Enthusiast Media Network. Stay tuned to TV Enthusiast and the Weekly Set Podcast for more coverage.